This is our first seminar in the uh, Distinguished Ecologist Seminar Series for 2013-2014. And today, we're really pleased to have with us uh, one of our own, former one of our own, uh, as the distinguished alumna, uh, Sarita Fry, from the University of New Hampshire. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Keith Postian in just a moment to uh, give her a, a, a more formal and shortish but not too short kind of introduction. And I just want to let everyone know that a couple things. Immediately following uh, the seminar, there will be a, a reception in the adjacent room. And uh, Jerry, I think there's a cash bar, is that right? So they just so did you have that piece of information? And also uh, tomorrow, Sarita, you're giving a seminar in uh, the Soil Crop Sciences Department? At noon. And what, what room number is that? Do you know? W09. W09. Plant Science Building. In the Nat Science Building. Plant Sciences Building. Plant Sciences Building. Nat Sciences, what's that? <laughs> All right, thank you, uh, Francesca. All right, so with no further ado, uh, Keith, would you like to introduce our guest speaker? Thank you. Thank you, Leroy. It's, uh, it's really a great honor to uh, to have the, the opportunity to introduce uh, Professor Sarita Fry from the University of New Hampshire uh, as, our, as our GDPE, GDPE Distinguished Alumna. I almost said alumnus, but I got that. Thanks, Leroy. Um, I first met Sarita, I think, in probably 1993. She was uh, working as a, as a lab technician for Ted Elliott at NREL. Um, we had actually uh, been working together in a project. I was at Michigan State with Elder Paul. Uh, we had a project uh, looking at uh, soil carbon dynamics in long-term agricultural field experiments around the country. Uh, I subsequently moved to CSU after a, the postdoc at MSU, and then Sarita and I had the opportunity a few times to go out driving around the country in the in the probe truck to various exotic places to, to do lots of sampling. I still recall uh, uh, we managed to visit the, the world's largest ball of twine in Cocker City, Kansas, on the way to, <laughs> to sample it at Kansas. So uh, it was quite an exciting time. Um, after a couple years of that, Sarita said, well, the heck with this business. I'm, uh, I want to be a grad student. And, uh, and then kind of the rest is history. So she was a graduate student with Ted Elliott, who uh, many of you, uh, unfortunately, uh, didn't have the opportunity to, uh, to meet as he uh, passed away uh, a few years ago. But Ted was an outstanding uh, microbial ecologist and, and ecologist. Uh, he had a knack for uh, finding lab technicians that could become graduate students and later on uh, outstanding scientists uh, uh, with uh, you know world uh, reputation. So um, anyway, Sarita was here. Uh, she finished in 1999, I think, with her PhD. Uh, went on to uh, Ohio State University as an assistant professor was there for, for three years and then decided that the uh, pastures were greener in New Hampshire and moved there. She uh, became an associate professor in 2006 and then uh, uh, became a full professor in 2011. It was interesting, there's a fact I didn't know about Sarita before. Uh, one of her honor, uh, one of her awards was that in 2011, she was the outstanding associate professor for the university in New Hampshire. So I thought that's a nice thing to have to put in front of your promotion committee when you're going to full professor. Uh, so Sarita has continued uh, over the years to do really outstanding and innovative work at the interface of uh, microbial ecology and processes and really trying to understand whole ecosystem function. She's worked in all kinds of systems, increasingly in, 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 in the forests in, in back east. And uh, I think her uh, story in her, her title here on uh, linking soil microbial communities and ecosystem function, a coming of age 
uh, a coming of age story is really indicative of, of the work that she's been doing uh, over her career. And so uh, I'm very happy to, uh, to, to be here and to have the opportunity to, to listen to uh, Sarita's talk. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Sarita and uh, welcome you back again as our uh, distinguished alumna. It's a great pleasure. So, thanks. Okay, so um, the students have been asking me for pieces of advice all day today, and I'm going to throw out one more, and uh, that actually does go back to my title that, um, <laughs> that Keith mentioned. So the piece of advice is that you should never go with the first title that comes to mind, especially if it comes to mind at 3 in the morning when you've just gotten off a transatlantic overnight flight to Europe. Um, but that's what happened. I was on my way to Sweden, and this was the title that I came up with, and it seemed like a great idea at the time, and I sent it off to Jerry, and then when it came time to put my seminar together, I had to actually make a, a story that fit this theme. <laughs> so, um, you know, we all, of course, know the literary genre, the coming-of-age story, and we, we tend to think of... Um, Protagonists, typically uh, often uh, teenage males who are going through some serious angst and um, uh, alienation and perhaps disillusion, and I don't want in any way to give that impression with this title. <laughs> um, what I really wanted to do with this talk was, at least at the time that I, well, what I do want to do with this talk is, um, um, I think as, as Keith alluded to, is I want to tell a little bit about my story in terms of, of how I am where I am today, but more importantly, I want to talk about the evolution and growth of microbial ecology um, over the past 15 or so years since I've left GDPE or since I've left CSU, and really talk about the fundamental changes that have occurred in microbial ecology and how that has influenced the, the work that I do. Um, and so um, with that, I'll get started. Um, before I sort of jump into the sort of the, the coming of age piece of this story, I want to just give you a, a quick overview of the research that I'm currently doing. Um, as Ted said, I'm now in the Northeast. Um, much of the work that we do is centered at the Harvard Forest Long-Term Ecological Research Site, where we have a number of long-term uh, long global change experiments. Um, the Northeast, um, as I'm sure many of you know, um, has high rates of nitrogen deposition. And so one of the themes of research in northeastern forests is the impact of this nitrogen deposition on um, forest health and forest function. And um, Harvard Forest falls along this gradient of, of nitrogen deposition rates from you know, on the order of, uh, that's not the pointer, uh, on the order of, um, 12 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year up to uh, northern Maine, where we have lower rates around 3 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year, but which are still three times higher than what you typically see here in the west, unless it's in the sort of high alpine um, system um, that Jill Barron and others work in. So one of our themes has been sort of the effects of nitrogen and nitrogen addition on ecosystem function. And that's going to play an important piece of the story that I tell today. Um, but we've also um, been looking at long-term simulated soil warming and have several uh, long-term soil warming experiments to address that question. Uh, we also, in my lab recently, or in my group, recently started um, a, a multi-factor experiment looking at the interactions between soil warming and nitrogen fertilization. And then most recently, through funding from the Department of Defense, we're adding a third component, and that is a biotic component where we are um, starting to look at this invasive species, which is quite a, 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 an issue in the north, in northeastern um, forests and is um, causing uh, um, a reduction in the germination of native tree seedlings and so on. And um, so we're trying to understand the below ground implications of this invasive plant. And we're doing that in the context of our other treatments. So just recently, um, with some eyebrow raising on the part of some, we actually invaded our uh, multi-factor experiment, a, a subset of it, with garlic mustard in a very controlled sort of way. But um, we now have a three-factor experiment that's looking at the 
this invasive species in the context of warming and nitrogen fertilization so that we can look at, the, at that three-way interaction. Um, so as Keith already said it, as I say at the top, I'm, I'm trained as an ecosystem ecologist or an e ecologist generally, obviously having come through the GDPE program. I clearly lean uh, towards the ecosystem end of that uh, ecology spectrum. Um, but I also have my feet firmly in, or at least I like to think I have my feet firmly in, in the subdiscipline of microbial ecology and also in soil science. And, and I recall, you know, one of the, you know, as I was preparing this talk, I thought back a lot about what I learned during my time at GDP, and I sort of picked, or I sort of remembered a lot of these nuggets that I got from classes or from interactions with Keith and Ted or others. And I remember that David Stein Graber in our um, community ecology class, which at the time all GDPE students had to take, I remember him saying or emphasizing that the really interesting things in ecology, the, the, the fundamentally interesting research was going to be happening or was happening at the interface of, of different disciplines or, within, or, or between sub-disciplines within um, ecology. And so I really took that to heart and have really tried to keep my feet in these different disciplines um, and, as Keith said, to try and uh, link what's happening at the level of the microbial community with what's happening at the um, ecosystem scale. Okay, so I just want to quickly define what I'm talking about uh, when, I, uh, when I'm referring to microbial community structure and ecosystem function. And I think this is obvious to most of you, but certainly in proposal reviews and so on, I've gotten questions about what it is I actually mean. So I'll just define those terms quickly. So as an ecosystem ecologist, you know, we, uh, we um, often uh, jump straight from sort of uh, the environment right to the process of interest. So maybe this is litter decomposition or um, nitrification or some other nitrogen cycling process. You know, we're interested in whether that process is occurring in a particular ecosystem and the rate at which it's occurring. And um, at least historically, uh, as ecosystem ecologists, we haven't been so concerned about uh, the underlying microbial um, mechanisms that drive that process. And, and I'll talk in a moment about why that, why that was or why that is. Um, but again, I'm, I'm particularly interested in trying to link the microbial community both in terms of physiological status, so activity, growth, efficiency, resource allocation, those types of things, and microbial community structure, which I'm defining in the, I think, typical ecological way, which is that it includes composition, so what taxa are there, what species are there, to the extent that we can define that in a microbial ecology context, and then also um, the diversity or the number, you know, the richness and even, evenness of, of, the, the, of the species or taxa that are present. Okay, so now we can um, talk a little bit about uh, microbial ecology coming of age. And I, I put this together last night, so this is my version. Um, I'm sure Diana or Matt or any of the other microbial ecologists in the room might have a very different um, version or view of events. Um, but again, there's, as, I, as I know you all recognize, there's been a real sea change in microbial ecology over the last 15 to 20 years. And, um, and I want to just take a few minutes to, to go through uh, sort of those changes and, and also just say that my time at CSU was sort of right here in this transitional period between what I refer to as an era that focused um, primarily on process level studies. And this goes back much further than um, I could put on the graph. I mean, this goes back to the 30s and 40s when um, Winogradsky and others were studying things like um, sulfur, uh, sulfur metabolism in Winogradsky columns and, and so on. So we had this long history um, up until the late 1980s of um, looking at the microbial community from a process, um, from a process level. And I guess in that context, then ecosystem ecology and microbial ecology weren't so different. Um, microbial ecologists were often looking at the same processes that ecosystem ecologists were interested in. And, um, you know, I was during this time, at least in the late 80s, doing my master's degree at the University of Virginia. And, you know, I remember that the, the real take-home messages, if you will, from my advisor then was, 
was this, that, that everything is everywhere, the environment selects, so that sort of old adage that's um, uh, attributed to Boss Becking, um, that, and that there's therefore no microbial biogeography, there are no endemic microbial species. Again, everything is everywhere, it's just dependent on the environment as to which uh, taxa might be um, uh, most abundant or most important in a particular environment. Um, he also was, was very, uh, he was often, very often said, we don't really care who's there, that's not important. Um, it's, it's what they're doing that, that matters. And, and finally, there was this idea that redundancy rules, that is that there's so much diversity in the soil or in microbial communities generally that uh, there's a lot of redundancy in terms of processes. So, you know, if one organism isn't there to do it, someone else will. And that really, um, who's there doesn't matter in terms of determining uh, rates, of, rates of processes. Uh, so, and of course, there was a long history at, at CSU of doing uh, process level soil e ecological work and, and a lot of really uh, uh, great studies that came out of, of CSU in the, in the late 70s and, and throughout the 80s. Um, but from a microbial ecology perspective, this all started to change around 1990, or that's where I'm putting the date. Um, just a few years before that, um, Holbin, TG, and others um, developed a method for extracting DNA from soil. Soil had been extracted from DNA as early as the early 70s, but this was really the first time that the method stuck and that, and that, and that people started to view this as a viable way to look at soil organisms. And there was a seminal paper by Torsvik et al. in 1990 that showed that soils are indeed very, they have very high levels of diversity. Um, and um, that this was something that needed to be, to be further explored. And so I put this, this sort of this time as the sort of the real beginning of this, this march, if you will, towards the omics era, which, which we're in now. Um, and so this was the period of sort of methods development um, and so on. And again, this is when I was at CSU and, and towards the end of that when I was doing my PhD. And so, you know, if we want to go back to this coming of age theme, there was some angst for me <laughs> as a graduate student during this time because there was a lot of um, uncertainty about how to proceed if I wanted to really um, link uh, microbial communities to ecosystem function. So as Keith mentioned, I was at that time um, working on uh, this project to look at different agricultural management uh, impacts on soil carbon storage, and I particularly wanted to bring in the microbial aspect of that and really try to understand how different agricultural management practices were affecting the structure of the microbial community and then ultimately influencing um, carbon storage. Um, but the tools just really weren't there to address that question at the level that I really wanted to address it. Um, and you know, I remember Elder telling me that anyone at this time who wants to become a microbial ecologist has to be trained in these new molecular techniques. And for good or bad, I didn't take his advice at that time. <laughs> Sorry, Elder. <laughs> um, and maybe part of that had to do with my own advisor, Ted, who would always ask me, you know, is this a method looking for a question or do you have a question that's driving the methods that you choose? And at the end of the day, I decided that the tools in their current form, at least at this time, were not going to allow me to really address the questions that I had. Um, but at any rate, it was about this time when Jim TG said it was time to open the black box and to really uh, embrace these new technologies and, uh, and really attempt to link uh, the structure of the microbial community and, and the activities of the microbes. Um, in 2001, Cavagelli and Robertson, at least for the first time that I could uh, find doing a very quick web of science search last night, uh, were the first to really use these terms in a, in a paper, so microbial community structure and ecosystem function. Um, and, uh, and then from there we moved, I, I think it was really until uh, the mid-2000s when uh, sort of the omics era started, and it's here that I, that I think we st suddenly um, came to a point where we could realize some of our 
our, our, our goals. We could actually test some of the hypotheses that we had. So some of the questions that I was asking back here in the, in the mid-90s, it took another 10 or 15 years for the methods to develop enough that I felt they were now the right tool to ask the questions that I had. Um, and so in 2005, we had our first high-throughput sequencing analysis published. Um, uh, the first soil pyro sequencing analysis in 2009. And in 2000, around 2007, 2009, we actually had enough sequences in the public databases that allowed us to begin identifying microbial taxa um, and allowing us to really say who was in the community, how their relative abundance was changing with time, what their level of gene expression um, was under a particular condition. Um, and then how this related to um, sort of the other measures of ecosystem function that we, that we were making. And I like to think now that we're actually, I hope, that we're actually entering a period of what I'm going to call an integration of approaches where, where we don't just, uh, we, we sort of had this pendulum really. So we had people looking at, we had a lot of work on process level studies and then pretty much microbial community, the, uh, the microbial ecology community moved wholesale towards molecular methods. And still a large part of the community is sort of in that mode of, of tool generation and, and tool application, but in my mind, not always asking really exciting ecological questions. Um, but I think we are at a point where we can now swing the pendulum back. And if we couple the new omics technologies with the process level, um, analysis with culture-based studies that allow us to isolate, you know, the most abundant taxa and really look at their physiology in the lab. We actually have um, a, a, a full toolbox that will allow us to start to make these linkages um, between the microbial community and the ecosystem. And so while there was, for me anyway, you know, this period of angst and I wouldn't say disillusionment, but certainly confusion during the, um, my time at, at CSU and, and during the, 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 the mid to late 90s, that has now transitioned to um, real excitement as, as we move forward. I think in the next 10 or 20 years, we're going to see some really exciting things coming out of the integration of all of these um, approaches when combined together. And what I want to do today is give you just one example of our work where we're trying to merge these different approaches um, uh, to ask a specific question. Okay, so now I want to give this specific example that I hope illustrates the, you know, what I'm talking about in terms of this integration of approaches. So I want to talk about our work um, at Harvard Forest where we've been looking at nitrogen, simulated nitrogen deposition effects on the soil microbial community. And just to put that in a little bit of context, I um, just want to give you the broader uh, ecosystem context, I'll put my ecosystem uh, ecology hat on for now. So, um, and just to, uh, to say what I'm sure you're all already aware of, but the terrestrial biosphere is currently a, a sink for, um, for atmospheric carbon, so up to a third of our total anthropogenic emissions are uh, stored on an annual basis in the terrestrial biosphere. And this is thought to uh, occur primarily in temperate and boreal regions. And, and there are a number of reasons for this. Um, has to do with CO2 fertilization due to climate change, um, uh, forest regrowth, particularly in the Northeast, excuse me, fire suppression policies, um, and so on. But nitrogen deposition is also one of the factors that um, in the last five or so years, people have, five, five or ten years, people have really been starting to look at. So what is the impact of fertilizing ecosystems with um, atmospheric uh, nitrogen deposition? What impact has that had on this terrestrial carbon sink? And, um, you know, a lot of work is focused on the above ground piece of this. So there is certainly consensus that nitrogen deposition on the whole leads to... Um, growth enhancement of many tree species and that that can um, and certainly is uh, one reason that we see this, uh, this terrestrial carbon sink. Um, but what's also becoming increasingly clear is that soils also play an important role in this. 
And I'm going to talk more about this particular aspect of it in my talk tomorrow. So I'm just going to today just sort of lay out the sort of the general trends and then tomorrow I'll come back in my soils talk and, and talk about it in more detail. But I'm just today doing this to, to set the stage. So um, because there's now this interest in understanding the soil uh, component and the, the potential for soils to, to be a sink for carbon under nitrogen um, deposition, we wanted to look at this at a long-term experiment that's been running at Harvard Forest for the last 25 years. So this was established by John Aber and Jerry Melillo in 1988, and it's now an experiment that I um, um, have been running for the past uh, five or six years. And um, we decided to go in a couple of years ago and, and look at uh, the carbon pools and see what, what, what happened in response to 25 years, or in that, at, that period, at that time, 20 years of simulated nitrogen deposition. And just quickly, the experimental design is that we have two uh, different stands. We have a pine stand and a hardwood stand. Um, we're fertilizing at three different levels, so no uh, additional nitrogen, so just the ambient rate, which is at about 0.8 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. Um, five kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year, which, excuse me, 50, I should just stick with the units I have here, five, <laughs> and not go back and forth, five grams of nitrogen per meter squared per year um, uh, in what we call our low uh, nitrogen treatment, and this is comparable to what we see in, in large parts of Europe and Asia, so these rates of deposition are not um, uh, sort of out of the realm of possibility. And then we have a, what we call a high, or you know, some would say very high, um, loading rate of 15 grams of nitrogen per meter squared per year. So that's the experimental design. Um, uh, again, without getting into a lot of detail, because I want to focus on the sort of microbial piece of this, but to, to, to make a, a long story as short as possible, we, we found that indeed the soils, particularly in the hardwood stand, do accumulate carbon under nitrogen additions. This is primarily due to an increase in the, the organic horizon. We see that as well in the pine stand. So in both stands under nitrogen fertilization at both levels, we see uh, an accumulation of organic matter. And then in the highest nitrogen treatment in the hardwood stand, we also see accumulation in the, in the mineral soil. And this is um, associated with uh, declines in uh, soil respiration, significant declines in soil respiration, and, and declines or suppression of litter and, and wood decay. And so, um, again, without going into a lot of detail today, what we're finding is that indeed our soils are um, uh, storing carbon under nitrogen fertilization, and we think that it's primarily due to a suppression of decomposition rather than to a stimulation of carbon inputs from uh, enhanced tree growth. And, uh, and now, that, so that's sort of the backstory. That's, that's the background. And so that's the ecosystem function, if you will, that I'm interested in right now. So carbon storage, carbon sequestration, carbon accumulation in response to nitrogen uh, fertilization. And so now what I want to do is talk about sort of what we're doing to understand how the microbial community might be involved in that in that process. So just to show you some of the general microbial characteristics, so um, across this gradient we see a decline, a significant decline in microbial, in total microbial biomass, particularly in the fungal component of that biomass. Um, this is fungal to bacterial ratios here. Uh, we also see a significant decline in uh, enzyme activity. Here I show proteolytic enzyme activity, but we also see this for the oxidative enzymes, so for those enzymes responsible for lignin degradation. Um, so clearly we are seeing uh, sort of a downregulation, if you will, in, uh, at least in the potential um, enzyme activity. And, and then the question is, well, what's happening uh, at the level of the microbial community to, uh, to elicit this response? The, the assumption in the literature, or the long-standing hypothesis in the literature, has been that uh, the, those um, primarily fungi that are, that are going after lignin as a nitrogen source, uh, uh, 
their enzyme systems are downregulated under high levels of nitrogen, and their um, abundance then declines. And then you may have other taxa coming in that are sort of less efficient decomposers. Okay, and that's sort of the, that's what we want to test, or at least one of the things that we want to, that we want to look at. So that was just to remind me to mention that we also see the same uh, decline in oxidative enzyme activity with uh, nitrogen addition, and to also say that in addition to just total soil carbon accumulation, we've, we've looked at the soil chemistry and we see an accumulation of the rel in the relative abundance of, of lignin and other sort of more recalcitrant compounds. So this stuff isn't getting de decomposed, and the question is why. Okay, so now going back to TG's um, 1977, 1997 uh, uh, adage that we need to open the black box. Well, now I think we're at a point where we actually can do that. You know, uh, five years ago we weren't there, but as of a few years ago we actually had the tools to unpack this box, um, particularly for the fungi, which is what I'm going to focus on. Um, we're particularly interested in the decomposition process um, because we're dealing with carbon stabilization or carbon storage. Um, fungi are the primary decomposers in our system. They, are, they represent about two-thirds of the biomass. And so for, for, for our system, it makes sense to target fungi. And, and that's what I'm going to talk about for, for the rest of my um, seminar. So. Um, our questions were then, how does fungal community structure respond to nitrogen additions? Can an understanding of the fungal taxa that are present actually help explain um, our observed, uh, the, the observed ecosystem scale responses in carbon storage? And I won't get to this today, but another question we're really interested in is whether these fungi that have been under nitrogen, um, enriched nitrogen conditions for 20 plus years, have they actually uh, adapted to these conditions in an evolutionary sense? Um, and has their physiology changed as a result of this, um, uh, of this sort of long-term exposure? And to that end, I'm working with an um, evolutionary biologist and mycologist at, at Harvard, Ann Pringle, and so she's sort of been bringing me up to speed on, on evolution and uh, all that that entails which has been a great learning, and ex learning experience in and of itself uh, for both of us, actually. Okay, so now I'm going to go into some microbial ecology, and I know that um, this isn't a necessarily a, a microbially oriented group, or not all of you are, are microbial ecologists, so I'm not going to talk much about the methods that we use. If you're interested in that, we can talk afterwards. Um, basically, I want to just highlight some of the key things that we're finding. Um, and I put this up just to, excuse me, just to show that, um, uh, I guess first to say that we are now using some of these uh, omics technologies to uh, look at the microbial community, and I'll come back in a moment then to tell you how we're coupling that with some of our other approaches. Um, but this is just to show really, or to make two points. Uh, the first is a, a rank abundance curve, which just shows that we have a very uneven community, which for a microbial community is, is quite typical, particularly a fungal community. So that is to say that we have a few taxa that are highly abundant, and we have a lot of taxa that are um, less abundant or, in many cases, rare. Um, and so the question there is, are the most abundant taxa um, actually the ones that are most active? Are they the ones that are important in the decomposition process? Are those the ones that we should be targeting? Um, or are there rare species that play an important role? Uh, the second point that I wanted to make, particularly for those uh, in the room who might uh, have experience with, with these sorts of data, is just to show, and this is just a, a rarefaction curve, just showing that we're doing a pretty good job, I think, of sampling our community. So we're, we're, these curves are starting to plateau off, so we're we're, look, we're, we're finding um, uh, and able to identify most of the taxa in our, in our system. So we're looking at anywhere from 60 to 120 operational taxonomic units, which in microbial ecology terms is sort of what we can, can say uh, is a, as close as we get to a species, if you will, and, and I'll use the term taxa or taxon rather than species um, for that reason. But anyway, we feel like we're doing a good job of sampling this community. 
Okay, so now I want to show you a few slides that, that uh, talk about the structure of the microbial community. And I'm going to focus just on the organic horizon here. We also have data from uh, a litter decomposition study, but um, I'll save that for another day. So if we look at the, um, at the data from a phylum level, we don't see really any, you know, we don't see any difference in uh, community structure. But if we drill down, which we're actually able to do now, and again, something we weren't able to do even five years ago. If we drill down and look at this community in more detail, what we see is that the, the community is dominated by one uh, genera, the Russula, the Russulas. This was a surprise at first. We were actually interested in targeting um, decomposer fungi because we're interested in this question of carbon stabilization. And so my, in my mind, I was sort of thinking saprobes. And here we find that uh, you know over half or yeah over half of the of the sequences in our database are um, are rustulas, which are ectomycorrhizal fungi. So these are symbionts of the trees in our system and are at least in an, under ambient conditions responsible for much of the nutrient acquisition that um, that the trees rely on, especially in terms of phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, so. You know, that, I guess that was the first thing to pop out. The, the other interesting piece of this is that what, what we see is that across the board, the ectomycorrhizal tax had generally declined, so with the exception of one species. So most of the ectomycorrhizal tax had declined, and that's consistent with our decline in overall fungal biomass. Um, but we have this one species, uh, and, it, and it doesn't matter too much, I guess, what the name is, but Rustula venaceae right here that actually increases significantly in relative abundance um, under the highest, uh, under both nitrogen fertilization treatments. And we're going to come back to this Rustula species because we're starting to think that it actually might be um, playing a role in decomposition that we didn't expect. Um, and, I'll, and I'll come back to that in a moment. So there's a Rustula story developing. Uh, a lot of information on this table. Let me just summarize the key points. And I really put this up here just to remind me what to say, not really uh, expecting you to, to read it. Um, the point I want to make here is that, so these are the, all of the taxa um, that show either a significant increase or a significant decrease. And again, there are quite a few um, ectomycorrhizal taxa that are declining in relative abundance. And then we have a series of saprotrophs that um, some of which are decreasing. So here's a lignolytic um, a genera that is decreasing in relative abundance. But then we also have some taxa that are increasing in relative abundance. So we can't just say that, uh, you know, we can't just say, for example, that carbon accumulation is, because, is happening because the lignolytic fungi are um, declining and therefore lignin degrading enzymes are, are being uh, downregulated. Uh, this is, uh, it's, it's, it's becoming a more complicated story than that. Um, and so uh, I guess what we're thinking now is that perhaps you get this, again, you get this shift in the community such that some of the, uh, the dominant ectomycorrhizal species fall out, some of the important uh, white rot fungi, the lignin degrading fungi perhaps fall out. That's opening up um, uh, niches, if you will, for ascomycetes um, and, and some more cellulolytic uh, degrading fungi sort of to um, rise in prominence, but perhaps they are weaker um, saprobes than the lignolytic fungi that we tend to um, see in a control system. And as a result, the net effect is that we see carbon uh, storage or carbon accumulation. OK, so this is then the point where I want to emphasize this integration of methods. So we're using some omics technologies, genomics here. We've also done some transcriptomic analysis looking at gene expression. But I don't want you to think that, that we've sort of, uh, sort of gone over to the dark side and jumped on the omics bandwagon. And we've left, uh, you know, I've left my ecosystem roots behind. Uh, quite the qu contrary. Uh, what we're doing now is trying to bring in some of the more, what might be termed more traditional approaches and coupling that with the omics technology to 
uh, I think, give us a more powerful um, way to answer these questions. So um, to do that, we're actually going back to sort of the age-old culture um, work, which, you know, if you tried to get any type of culture work funded in the late 80s and through the 90s and early 2000s, you would have been laughed off of the panel. You'd have been laughed out of the room. Um, you know, why do this when you can uh, use new, these new molecular tools? Two years ago, Ann Pringle and I submitted a proposal to NSF, and we said we're going to couple uh, culture work with the omics technologies, and this is going to really allow us to, to learn more than we could with either approach alone. And our proposal was funded as being highly novel. So um, <laughs> there you have it. Um, so what we're doing is we're going out and we're collecting leaf litter, we're collecting sporocarps, we're sp collecting um, uh, decaying wood, and we are, I, we are culturing as many isolates as we can get our hands on um, from these systems. And our goal is to have the same species isolated from the different treatment plots, because if we have the same species isolated from each of the three treatment plots, we can then look at their physiology and see if that has been altered by 20 plus years of nitrogen um, additions. And we can also start to begin to ask this question about adaptation and whether that's occurred. Um, so we now have a culture collection of several hundred isolates. Um, many of those represent some of the most abundant taxa that we have in our 454, our sequencing database. Um, you know, we're continually going back and forth between the two. If we see something in our 454 database that we see is highly abundant um, and we don't have it in our culture collection, then we go out and we try to find it. Um, because we want to, right now at least, our thinking is that we should be working with the most abundant um, taxa in the, in the community. Um, I talked to my postdoc who's doing this work um, last night, and I think she said about 17% of the 454 database is represented in our culture collection, which considering that we used to think that we could only culture 1% of the community, you know, I'm feeling pretty good about that. And I think we'll probably get up close to a quarter by the time we've, we've um, finished this work. Well, it's, it's never going to be finished, so maybe, you know, we'll get beyond that. But in the next year or so, I, I think we'll, you know, have about a quarter of the taxa in culture. And what we're doing then with this, and again, I'm not going to, go through all of the data we have, but just give you a snapshot. Um, we're then in the lab um, effectively doing uh, sort of uh, uh, transplant experiments or common garden experiments, and we're exposing isolates that were, uh, so the same taxon, same taxon, the same species that was found in the control environment, um, and we're putting it on its home environment, that is what it would, uh, have seen under field conditions. And I guess I should say first that this is oak litter that's being colonized and decomposed by a particular fungal isolate. And the, the um, oak litter is on uh, an auger substrate, basically. And in there is nitrogen at the levels that the um, organism experiences under field conditions. And so we have you know, a, a species that was isolated from the control plots on the control nitrogen level, and we have that same isolate in a high nitrogen environment. We then have the same species, but isolated from one of our nitrogen amended treatments. And likewise, we, we look at the decomposition rates of that fungus in its control environment, meaning it's in the condition that it's actually not, not um, used to, or in its home environment, which is the, the high nitrogen um, treatment. And so we've done a series of, of these decomposition experiments, and this is just a summary. I don't have time to go through all of the sort of individual isolates, but this represents many isolates across our, um, from our cult culture collection. And this figure isn't quite um, organized the way I would like it, but I'll, I'll walk you through it. So basically what we have are, this is percent decomposition. So this is the amount of decomposition that occurred on oak litter after seven weeks of decomposition at 25 degrees. So under optimal conditions in the lab, 
The only thing that's different across these is that uh, where the organism came from, so was it isolated from a control plot or was it isolated from a nitrogen fertilized plot? And it's um, the environment that it's um, incubated in. That is, is it incubated in the home environment where um, you have low levels of nitrogen present or is it being incubated in its home environment where it has high levels of um, nitrogen availability. And the, the quick take home message here is if you look at the, so these are uh, divided into the basidiomycetes and the ascomycetes. And if you don't know that much about fungi, that's fine. Basically, most of the wood decay fungi, or excuse me, the, the um, saprotrophic fungi, the lignin degrading fungi are going to be in the basidiomycete category. And um, ascomycetes tend to be primarily cellulolytic in their decomposing ability. Um, and the interesting thing that we're finding is that for the basidiomycetes, um, if you look at the isolates from the control plots in the control environment, they decompose at a much faster rate than the isolates from, that have been exposed to nitrogen for 20 plus years. Um, and it doesn't matter how they're grown in the lab. So this appears to be a, a physiological shift that is perhaps not uh, quickly <coughs> reversible. Um, so this then suggests that we actually do have a, a physiological shift in some of these taxa um, that are also um, showing declines in their relative abundance uh, from our 454 data, data set. Just to give you one quick example, um, this is uh, Urpex lacteus. This is a white rot fungus. Um, if we look at, so a, a basidiomycete, if we look at its um, decomposition ability, again, it's de it, it de decomposes faster if it was uh, isolated from a control environment and incubated in a control environment. But for those isolates that have been exposed to nitrogen for 20 plus years, they have a, 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 a suppressed um, ability or reduced ability to decompose plant litter. And if you look at their oxidative enzyme capability, so this is the lignin degrading enzymes, you see that they're, uh, at least the potential for them to produce lignin degrading enzymes is very much reduced if they have um, been uh, living, so to speak, in a nitrogen fertilized system for a long period of time. Um, we don't see that same uh, effect for the cellulose degrading enzymes. So certainly this is supporting this idea that nitrogen, long-term nitrogen deposition um, affects the production of oxidative enzymes that are responsible for degrading lignin and other more recalcitrant carbon compounds. Okay, so uh, I have just a few minutes left. I don't think I have too many more slides. I just wanted to um, return quickly to the, the mycorrhizal story because I think there's something interesting going on here too. So I said that we have this one taxon of uh, this one species of ectomycorrhizal fungus that increases significantly um, under nitrogen fertilization. Here I'm actually showing data on the root tips themselves. Um, so Jesse Sadowski, a PhD student in my lab, is focusing on ectomycorrhizal roots, but he sees the same thing. This one, this one species of Russula is, is taking over the community, if you will, taking over the, the roots um, of, of, our, uh, of the trees in our plots under high levels of nitrogen, whereas other taxa like quaternaries, as an example, um, decline. Uh, the interesting thing is that he's also looking at the enzyme activities associated with these roots, and I want you just to focus on the bars on the right. So these are the enzyme activities associated with Russula um, uh, um, colonized root tips. So and just to remind you that Russula increased from about 30% under ambient conditions to about 50 to 70% uh, under fertilized conditions. So that is 50 to 70% of the root tips in the plots are occupied by this one taxon. And if you look at the right hand bars, again, these are the, the enzyme activities associated with those um, ectomycorrhizal root tips. So here you've got cellulose or cellulose degradation, chitinase, um, protonase, and so on. Um, and 
The thinking with ectomycorrhizae, historically anyway, is that they're not involved in, de um, in decomposition, um, that they don't have the machinery in particular to degrade cellulose. And yet what we're finding with this particular rustula taxon is that it has the ability, or at least it appears to have the ability to degrade cellulose. It certainly has enzyme activity associated with, um, with these root tips, and it increases under nitrogen fertilization. Same for chitinase. Um, where, uh, 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 and in, um, sort of in contrast, we actually see a decline in the oxidative enzyme, so the ability to degrade lig lignin. So again, I think the story that's developing here is that perhaps this rustula species is changing its lifestyle in response to nitrogen, and perhaps it's becoming somewhat of a saprobe. And um, you know, that's one of the next steps that I'll talk about in just a minute in terms of, of what we want to evaluate, and maybe I go to that now. So again, this was really meant just to be one example of how we're trying to couple uh, sort of more traditional biogeochemical approaches also culture-based studies with the uh, sort of modern omics approaches to sort of really allow us to drill down to, to the level of the microbial community. And so some of our next steps are to um, really uh, look to see if the expression of these lignin-degrading enzymes are down-regulated under chronic conditions, especially for these abundant taxa that we're noting in the lab have this reduced capacity to decompose. Um, under high nitrogen conditions. What's going on with rustula? That's a story we want to um, follow up on. Is it acting like a sap, more of a, is it acting more like a saprobe under chronic in conditions? But it is, is it a weaker saprobe than these lignin degraders that are being lost from the system? And, and is that why the net effect then is still a, a carbon, an overall carbon accumulation? And finally, again, although I, I didn't talk too much about it here, we're really interested in this idea that fungi may be able to adapt to these conditions over time. We want to know whether that, that is an evolutionary adaptation or whether it's something that they can reverse, you know, whether it's something that's, that's physiologically plastic. Um, so again, just to give you a flavor of uh, the type of work that we're doing. And so with that, I will thank uh, the many great folks in my lab, many of, of whom have been involved with this work. And then also Ann Pringle, who's our um, evolutionary biologist, mycologist colleague at, at Harvard. Um, and thank you all for your attention. I think we have time for some questions. He told me he would have a question for me. So you mean soil fauna? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he wants to know if the soil fauna are changing under these conditions and if that's impacting um, breakdown of the organic matter. Is that the, yeah. We don't know. I'd love to have someone look at that. We haven't really looked at, at the soil fauna. So if Diana or someone else has a student that would like to address that, that would be really swell. Jill? Did you, you did those experiments in the hardwood forests, but did you also look at the pine responses, the chemical responses in the pine? Uh, we've looked at the pine sort of at, at a coarser level of resolution. We've looked at, at, at microbial biomass, fungal biomass. Um, but the problem with the pine stand is that in 2008 we had an ice storm that, uh, well, first of all, for any of you that have been to Harvard Forest, you know that we actually killed the pine trees in the high nitrogen stand. And so it was already quite decimated. But then in this ice storm in 2008, all of the remaining pine snapped off. And it's now very difficult to, to work there. And we've stopped fertilizing that treatment and have stopped working there, unfortunately. I mean, we could probably get in to get samples if we try hard enough, but we haven't done that. So. So are you talking about in terms of the carbon storage or the... I mean, is it, is it the plant, re, a tree responds to nitrogen emission and then change all the exudates and the interaction with the microbial team beyond the right sphere that it kind of then brings it down the line or is it a direct nitrogen effect in the wilderness? So we can use the best of... Okay. 
Okay, so the question is, is it a direct, is the nitrogen response a direct effect on the fungi or is it indirect through the plants? Because uh, of course as plants have ready access to nitrogen, they may not um, need to um, invest in this costly venture that are mycorrhizae and um, you know, they have access to inorganic nitrogen and they don't need the mycorrhizae to, to help them out. Um, we're not sure. I mean, it's a good question. We, we don't know. I mean, that's one of the questions that we have and, and that we, you know, that Jesse in particular is trying to address with his ectomycorrhizal work. Um, certainly the roots are still colonized by mycorrhizae, but they're colonized by this one taxa that may or may not be serving a traditional mycorrhizal role. It might actually be, you know, perhaps partly parasitic or maybe it's acting more as a sap robe. And so we don't really know what benefit the plants are getting from that, from that one species that has seem, you know, seemingly taken over. Um, so good question, we don't know. Um, the other piece of that that I'll talk about in my seminar tomorrow is that we have looked at sort of the plant component in terms of, uh, in terms of the carbon storage picture and that is you know what's happening with carbon inputs in terms of root root inputs litter inputs and so on and um, you know what we see there is that really the nitrogen uh, additions have not stimulated tree growth to nearly the extent that we might have anticipated and we don't see um, much in the way of increased or enhanced carbon inputs to the system which is one of the reasons we think that it's really a decomposition um, response We have, we have time for one more question, and I'd like to ask that question. <laughs> so you mentioned uh, you were going to test this, uh, this hypothesis about local adaptation versus phenotypic plasticity in the, in the fungal response to these chronic you know, nitrogen uh, additions. Can you tell us a little bit how you're planning to do that or how you would uh, distinguish between those two um, you know, competing hypotheses? Yeah, well, so we're... That, that's actually part of the common garden experiment. It's actually turned out to be a little bit more challenging than we thought, but we had the idea, um, well, so my, my original idea was why don't we, you know, well, let's just sequence the, the genome and what, won't that tell us what we need to know, but um, Anne was quick to, quick to point out that um, it doesn't quite work that way. So um, number one, it's very challenging to sequence the genome of a lot of different taxa and then also to just pinpoint a particular, a very small change is, is not straightforward. So her suggestion was that we do this common garden experiment and by placing uh, species that had been, the same species that had been isolated from different plots and looking at their growth rates and decomposition ability and so on, we would start to be able to tease this out. So for example, if we put an isolate from um, the nitrogen addition plot um, on a control media where it doesn't have high levels of nitrogen, if it had changed in an evolutionary way, it would not revert back to its, it, you know, it wouldn't have, you know, a higher um, decomposition ability and lower in its, in its home environment, if that makes sense. So, and I think we saw a little bit of that in the, in the data that I showed. Um, but I have to say the data have been a little bit more difficult to interpret from that standpoint than we, than we imagined. So if there's anyone here that is an evolutionary e ecologist or biologist and has some suggestions, I would love to talk with you. So maybe you have some. You asked the question, so. I could, I could, so. <laughs> I could point to a few people. Maybe. Okay. Uh, all right. So. Again, let's give Sarita a nice big hand for her. <laughs> and we have a little token of appreciation for you. Uh, this is uh, a plaque from GDPE. It reads 2013 GDPE Honor Alumna, Sarita Fry. And we would like to offer this to you and appreciation for your coming to talk with us and give a, a wonderful seminar and an acknowledgement of your. Uh, your accomplishments. So thanks so much. Let's see how we do this like this. Sure. <laughs> let's, let's go right out here.